From God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to reread to you just that last verse from the uh, passage that we read. Uh, then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. My dear friends, that's the part that uh, really gives us an, an ironic twist, gives us something that is a little bit difficult to understand. The first part of this passage from Malachi is, is really pretty simple for us as people who are standing this side of the resurrection. Those of us who can see all that happened with John the Baptist and with Jesus, we're able to look at that passage and understand exactly what's happening. We understand that it's John the Baptist who's the one who came before Christ. And we understand that, but it really wasn't that clear for the Israelites. They knew that they were waiting for the promised Messiah. They knew that the prophecies were about that Messiah, but they struggled. They struggled with different parts and pieces. They didn't know that Jesus was going to come, the Messiah was going to become born in Bethlehem as a baby. They didn't know that he was going to die for the sins of the world. There were a lot of things that in the prophecy seems very clear to us, and yet doesn't seem so clear to them at the time. Isaiah writes a number of the things that we see at Christmas, including the things that are in the banners around us about how uh, he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And we read that on Christmas Eve. And Malachi has some words that are, that are similar to what uh, is, is being talked about here when he talks about Jesus, when he says, I'm sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. And we hear those words of Isaiah saying, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the highways. Isaiah gives us those things earlier, and now Malachi gives us to him again. But it's hard for us in our time to remember, and to be, we have to be taught, that the time between Malachi and the time that Jesus came was a couple hundred years. So they would had the last prophets, they'd been waiting, they'd been waiting, they'd been waiting, and what happens when you wait? You forget. When generations go by, we forget. Things go by, and we're just not sure that they were true. And so... It was hard for the Israelites to understand what was going on. And so looking back at those first pieces and looking at them from our side of history, we can see that when Malachi talks about a messenger who will come and prepare the way of the Lord, it's obvious. That's John the Baptist. No problem there. And then when we see that he says that the Messiah is suddenly in the temple, I like that you thought that Linda, that you thought that, that was, uh, that was uh, uh, Jesus in his resurrected form coming at, at the end. And that's true. But from, in my mind, what the first thing that strikes me is Jesus, when he appears in the temple the first time, is about eight years old. You know, he's left his parents behind, and they're like, hey, where were you? And he's like, didn't, didn't you know I was going to do my father's business? For Joseph and Mary, that had to be a stunning moment after a couple of days of, of searching for him and having to go back and walk all the way back to Jerusalem. And probably even more stunning for the priests who are sitting there, and now there's this little kid sitting there teaching them everything. You know, who taught him? You know, because you didn't work your way up in the ranks of the, of the synagogue without being taught by others. And so they had to have been surprised, yet I doubt they connected it to this piece in Malachi. I doubt that they, they got what was going on. And so we have those pieces that, that they look back on them and they were difficult. And then there's this whole thing about the Messiah purifying and refining. And specifically purifying and refining the Levites. The Levites were the priestly clan. Out of the Levites, all of the, all of the people who took care of the synagogue were there, and the temple were from that group. In fact, they did not get a portion of the land, but the, the tithe that was given in was to take care of them and to take care of the temple. So you had 11 tribes that were, that were, that were tithing, actually 12 tribes that were tithing, and if they were giving 10%, then, then, the, then the Levites were seeing about 120%. Or they were living the fat life, weren't they? No, they had to take care of the temple too, okay? So they had, they had certain things they had to do. But the refining and the purifying, that was all set down in the, in the law, in the code, that the, the high priest wouldn't go in without being sacrificed for. There was a sacrifice given for him specifically so that he would be holy as he went into the Holy of Holies and then gave the sacrifice for all the people. But as Pastor Tom talked about a couple of weeks ago, that was something that happened over and over and over again. And always sin came back, and Jesus was the one who would take away the sins of the world. It would be that one perfect sacrifice. And so we have these pictures that we see and these things that we understand, and we, and we see all of this coming to a conclusion and the climax in these words where it then says to us that, that there's this purification and refining of the Levites. Now, before I go too much further, I, I do want to take a moment, and I, I did this this morning, and, and it turned out a lot of people were really thankful, because I think most of us have seen at some point in our lives that you refine metals by heating them up, okay? Here it talks about silver and gold, and what it does is it, it allows the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the 
basically the trash to come to the top, the things that are in the metal to come to the top, and everything else they can, they can flow out as, as, as liquid. And so it's a way of refining metal so that they're more pure. But when it says that this, this piece about, and like Fuller's soap, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, what are you talking <laughs> about? Okay, now, let me tell you, I'm just old enough, okay, and most of you aren't, uh, I'm just old enough that I can remember the Fuller Brush Man. Anybody, you've probably heard about that, and maybe you haven't even heard about that. So the Fuller, Br the Fuller Brush Company would come to your door and knock on the door, and they would have things to sell. It was the, kind of the last of the, of the roving salespeople. And I can remember I was living in San Francisco. I was probably about nine, ten years old when this happened. I'm very full of myself, and the doorbell rang. I wanted to be the first one there because I knew what we were supposed to do. A, don't let anybody in unless you know who they are. B, don't let anybody in it. Anyway, and C, get rid of salespeople. Okay? <laughs> so I'm like nine, ten years old. I go running down there, and, and the doorbell's rung. I go, who is it? Because that's all we did in San Francisco. Not very inviting, is it? You know? You know, we don't, we don't open the door and see who it is. We just go, who is it? From behind the closed door. And the guy, this guy goes, full of brush, man. And I go, uh, we don't want any. Because I didn't know what he was. So I go running upstairs, hey, Mom, Dad, there's some guy down there. He says, the Fuller Brush Man. Hey, go back and get him. We need him. We were going to buy something. So I go running back <laughs> down. And he's like three, three houses up, you know, hearing people tell him we don't want any. And I go, hey, my parents want something. Come on, come on back. And he comes back, and, he's, and he sells them something. So a fuller in the time of, of Jesus was the person who made the cloth white. Okay, it was a person who made the cloth very, very white. I don't want to get into how they did it because it, it, some, of, some of the chemicals and how they got them was not real fun. But anyway, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that after church. But they were the ones who made the cloth as pure as snow and white so that they could then dye it the color that they wanted it to be. All right, so when, when, when uh, Malachi writes this stuff, it's kind of like he's mixing metaphors here. He talks about the refiner's fire for the metal and he talks about the fuller's soap for the, for the cloth and he's kind of kind of mixing it up, but both of those point to what Jesus does, which is to make us white as snow, to make us pure and holy, to take away all of the sins of the world. So that's, that's great stuff too, and they would have understood that better than we do today, because they knew what a fuller was, and they knew how that, I would guess that most of us, now a few people in the congregation always have, most of us have probably never done refining of metals with, with heat, okay? Um, most of us have probably never tried to get, you know, cloth to be as white as snow, although, you know, we do try to bleach some things and get things to, you know, lose their stains, but still, we don't, we don't know where the fuller is. And so, for these people at Jesus' time and, and hundreds of years before, they knew exactly what this was. They knew what, what the image was. But they were still struggling with what Malachi was trying to get across and what the prophecy was trying to get across. And what it was talking about was refining the priests, making them holy. And this is where the irony comes in. This is where the irony comes in because if you read that last piece, what it says here is this. Then the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. How was the sacrifice of the priests going to become pure? Through Jesus. And here's where the real irony steps in. Because it would be those priests who were standing there and who had gathered in small groups and large groups and figured out how they could put Jesus to death, who would be purified through his death. It was in the very death and resurrection of Jesus that these priests would be purified through their belief in him. And yet, they were the ones who were causing it to happen. So one of my favorite, if not my, you know, there are a couple favorite things that Jesus says from the cross. I'm sure different people have different ones that are their favorites. But when Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing, I know that it's not just about the soldiers who have pinned his hands and feet to the cross and who are guarding to make sure they can't get away. I know it's not just about the people who are walking by and saying hurtful things. I know it's also about the priests who were there, who had taken him through this process to make sure he was condemned. And I know it's also about us. Because, you see, we all do things that we don't know what we're doing. It's easy when Jesus is on the cross to be talking about the soldiers. You know, they were just putting another person to death the way they always did. But they didn't know who this was. But let's look at the priests for a moment and, and let's look at the Levites who took care of the temple and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the people who had gathered around and said, how do we get rid of this guy? He's messing up the Passover. He's riling people up. He's going to cause problems for us. And 
They met, and they found ways to go to him and ask questions, hoping he'd fall into some trap. And finally, in the end, they went to Herod, and they went to Pilate, and they came back to Pilate again, and finally they pushed the issue so hard that Pilate had to say, I wash my hands. You guys do what you want to do. Well, we don't have a law that allows us to kill him, Pilate. Only you can do that. So he writes it out, that death sentence. Jesus is going to be put to death. Why? Because of the very people who he's come to save. What if it had been different? What if the priests and Levites had recognized who Jesus was? Recognized him as the Messiah? Then they wouldn't have put him to death. He wouldn't have been raised for our sins. And we wouldn't have received that forgiveness. The Son of God had to come and give up his life as a ransom. Had to be there to wash away the darkness of our sins. Had to be doing the things that Jesus did. So his disciples didn't understand and he had to hide from everyone that his whole mission in life, the mission of the Messiah, was to come and lay down his life for all people, for the sheep that he was going to take care of. And so in this passage from Malachi, we have this interesting little twist that he gives us. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem, the offering from the priests in the synagogue, will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. It's only becoming pleasing because of what Jesus has done for them. The irony is that they can't see. They don't know what they're doing. And yet they are leading Jesus to that place that Jesus wants to go so that he can give up his life for all of us. And so I ask this question, a question for us to ponder this week. Do you always know what you're doing? When it comes to sin and grace, do you always know what you're doing? Do you always know what's right and what's wrong? I had a class when I was at seminary. This was probably the, the toughest single hour of class I can remember. Because every single one of us, to one degree or another, was going to disagree with the professor who was right. And one way or the other, uh, some were going to leave still saying that he was wrong. Here was, here, was his, here was his point. He said, are there things that you do that are hurtful to other people that you don't realize are hurtful? Okay, we'd all give that one. All right? And then he would say, when you do those things, do you think of them as sins, or would you go and confess them? And we're like, well, no, I didn't think I'd done anything wrong. Okay. So then he would say, he'd get us to say, so what are the really unforgivable sins out there? What are the really bad things that people can do? And there was this whole list of things brought up. And he, then he brought the point home, and he said, if a person doesn't know that it's a sin, and doesn't believe that it's a sin, are they still forgiven? And those words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing, come back into play. Because you see, God loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus to forgive us even of the things that we don't understand are part of our brokenness. Even to forgive us of the things that we do that we don't realize are wrong. Even of the things that we continue to do because we think somehow they've got to be right when they're wrong. I have come to the conclusion, especially watching our world today, that the people who are in play in all the political stuff and all the world stuff, nobody ever believes they're wrong. Nobody believes what, what they're doing is wrong. But we sure take sides, don't we? And we sure have ways of pointing the finger and saying, this person's wrong, that person's wrong, and making rules so we can figure out what is wrong. And I've realized sometimes in life, people do something that they think is right, and then we change the rules 20, 30 years later, and then we find their Instagram and go, look at what this person was doing, right? Or, we didn't have Instagram 23 years ago, but we go back. This person delivered this speech. This person said these things. And nobody gets the chance to really change with the times. They have to be right all the time, unless we, otherwise we're going to be pointing that finger at them. Have you ever been wrong and not known it? Have you ever hurt someone and not known you were hurting them, even when you weren't trying to hurt them? We all have. We've all been there. And the good news today of the gospel is that Jesus loves us even when we are part of that group that he embraces when he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Because all the time, every day, there are things where we don't realize what we're doing or the impact that we're having or how it's treating other people. And we even do things that we think are right and God would have seen was wrong. Because we have lost sight of that perfection. We have lost sight of all that is right and wrong in our world. So we have this amazing message to share. It's not the message of going out to people and telling them how wrong they are. The church has gotten very good at that, but that's not what we're here for. It's about going out and telling people that God loves them all the time, no matter what. 
That God loves them when they think they're right and they're doing something wrong. That God loves them when they are caught up in things that they know are wrong and they're still doing them. That God continues to forgive every kind of sin in every kind of way possible. And sometimes I think we lose sight of that. But at Christmas time, that's when we need to see that in the innocence of the child born in Bethlehem, the one who was pure and holy and is still pure and holy, he came for that purpose, to take away the sin of the world. The one sacrifice, the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world was the one sacrifice the priests could never make. Hmm. Not in the temple. But they made it when they took Jesus to the cross. They thought what they were doing was right. They were saving their nation. They were saving their religion. They were getting rid of this heretic. But Jesus was the only one who knew. He was bringing salvation to the world. And when he looked down on his world from that cross, he didn't condemn them for all that they had done wrong. He didn't condemn them for the pain and suffering he was feeling. He didn't even condemn them for the fact that he would feel the, the, the incredible pain and suffering and aloneness of being separated from God, which is still something I have to leave to the mysteries of God, because how was God separated from God? But it happened. And in the midst of all that, Jesus looked and in mercy said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And that, my friends, is the message we bring and the message of Christmas. Joy to the world, for Christ has come. Amen. Amen.